The island of Bornholm, Denmark rests in the Baltic Sea, 100 miles southeast of Copenhagen. 160 years ago, Mormon missionaries made the 5,000-mile trip and knocked on the door of Diedrich and Kirsten Funk. The year was 1853, just two years from when Apostle Erastus Snow first dedicated the island for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Diedrich and Kirsten had been married for 30 years and had 13 children when they joined themselves to the Mormon faith. Missionaries and their new converts suffered intense persecution for their beliefs. Diedrich and Kirsten decided to join with the other Danish saints and emigrate to Utah. They sold their home, packed what belongings they were allowed, and embarked on a journey to America. Eleven of their thirteen children joined them on their journey as they looked forward with a newfound faith to a new life in the new world. Traveling over land and sea, the Funk family landed in Liverpool, where they boarded the steamship Tuscarora for America. All but one of the Tuscarora's 547 occupants were Mormon immigrants. Seasoned agents from the church quickly organized the passengers into congregations, wards and districts with leaders. Order was kept by establishing simple rules. In bed by 8 p.m., up and ready with cleaned quarters by 7 a.m. On July 3, 1857, after 77 uneventful days on the sea, the Funk family set foot on American soil in the port of Philadelphia. All the passengers of the Tuscarora had one thing in common. They did not have the means to complete their trek to the Salt Lake Valley. They needed to wait through the winter, saving what they could in order to finish their journey. The following spring arrived, but the Funks were met by disappointment again when the U.S. Army, under the direction of Colonel Albert Johnston, invaded Salt Lake City to subdue a supposed Mormon rebellion. The invasion of Johnston's army drove 35,000 saints in the north part of the state to the south. Due to the turmoil caused by the Utah War, all immigration to Utah was delayed a year. After two long years, the Funks renewed their journey into the Rocky Mountains. Captain James Brown led the ox and wagon expedition. Twice they were met by Sioux warriors looking to trade for goods. Before they reached Echo Canyon, provisions ran low, and the travelers subsisted on a single slice of bread per day with nothing on it for their meals. Thankfully, a fellow traveler offered to trade their dog for 50 pounds of flour. On August 29, 1859, the Funks arrived in the Salt Lake Valley. After a few days in Union Square, they headed north to join their two eldest daughters in Plain City, near Ogden. For a year, the family was together again. Answering a call from Brigham Young to settle Cache Valley, Diedrich and Kirsten moved their family to Richmond. They lived four years in the Richmond Fort to protect against Shoshone attacks. Young Marcus quickly became known for his horsemanship, and when he wasn't working on the family farm, he earned extra money working as a teamster for William Preston. The job changed Marcus's life for good when he agreed to drive one of Preston's teams on what the Mormon settlers called a down and back. Teams of wagons and oxen made a six-month round trip from Salt Lake to Florence, Nebraska, and back again to ferry emigrant saints to their new home in the Salt Lake Valley. The three-month journey home to Salt Lake provided enough time for Marcus to fall in love with and become engaged to a young immigrant also from Denmark, Magdalene Westenskow. Three weeks after arrival in the Salt Lake Valley, Marcus and Lena, as he called her, were married in Manti and sealed the following month in the Salt Lake Endowment House. Marcus bought land in Richmond and began his life together with Lena. He worked hard farming every inch of his property and found success eventually owning 60 acres with herds of cows, sheep, and horses. Ten years later in 1874, Brigham Young called the Funks and their five children to move to southern Utah to help settle Utah's Dixie. This was a sacrifice that Marcus and Lena accepted. They sold what they could and loaded the remainder into two four horse wagons, one driven by Marcus, the other driven by nine-year-old Orlando and seven-year-old Will. 
Not long into the journey, baby Willard developed pneumonia. Lena was sure that if he could receive a blessing from Patriarch Charles Hyde, the baby would survive. In haste, they made their way to the Hyde home in Salt Lake, only to find the Patriarch not home. They waited and prayed, but began to lose hope. As they loaded the wagons to resume their journey, Brother Hyde returned and in his wheelchair rushed to give the infant a blessing. Willard Peter was healed, and they went on their way rejoicing. Washington, Utah, near St. George, was the Funk's home for 15 years. Marcus served as counselor and later bishop of the Washington Ward. While bishop, he was also elected the mayor of Washington and named president of the Washington Field Canal Company, an entity formed to organize water distribution from the unpredictable and often destructive Virgin River. Lena was an accomplished cook and seamstress. She decorated her home in beautifully embroidered furniture. It was her job to entertain visiting general authorities when they came into town. General Relief Society President Eliza R. Snow and Church President Brigham Young all stayed in the Funk home. Lena was an irreplaceable support and beloved companion to Marcus all his life. As a leader in the community, Marcus was asked by church leadership to enter into plural marriage. Again, he and Lena answered yes. Marcus married Anna Christina Iverson on June 26, 1879. She was the eldest daughter of Hans Peter Iverson. The family called her Aunt Steenie or Annie. She was loved and accepted by all, and Lena mentored Annie in homemaking arts. During the Washington years, Annie bore three children, Anna Doretta, Luella, and Wallace Morton. Annie learned to weave cotton rugs working in Washington's cotton factory. Profit from her rag carpets helped her support her children. Six years later, despite his many responsibilities, Marcus was again asked to marry. In 1885, he married Anne Marie Sorensen Iverson. She was called Maria and was the widow of Chris Iverson. Maria had already endured many hardships in her life. Within two years, she had lost four children and her husband. She was left with only one daughter, Annie. Together with Marcus, they welcomed another daughter, Mina Elia. In 1887, Congress passed the Edmunds-Tucker Act prohibiting unlawful cohabitation, and U.S. Marshals began actively pursuing and prosecuting men who stayed with their polygamous families. Marcus would not abandon his family, so was forced to spend seven months in the state penitentiary, where he penned these plaintive lines. In my lonely cell I sit, thinking of my home so dear, far away from it bereft, no one here to love and cheer. In the prison cell I sit, thinking of my family dear, how they wept and how they felt when I left them to come here. God will bless you, family dear. His special care to you be given. Angels watching above, they, they upon you smile from heaven. In the prison yard I walk, waiting for the gate to open. When I can to you return, never more from you be taken. Always with you home remain, sharing each one's joy and pleasure, working for each other's good, and enjoy God's hidden treasure. At the conclusion of his sentence, 1889, he wrote a letter to his state president asking for a release from his assignment to Dixie so he could relocate where a man might farm without a dam breaking and where U.S. Marshals would not interfere with his family. Fleeing persecution, Marcus and Lena moved with 10 of their 11 children to Sanford, Colorado, where they lived in a cottage and Marcus farmed. Annie stayed in Washington with her younger sister, Florina, who happened to be married to Marcus and Lena's eldest son, Orlando. They would make the trek a few years later. When Annie and Marie finally joined them in Sanford, the Funk family moved to the nearby town of Eastdale, population 70. Eastdale soil was rich and attracted settlers. A ward was established with Marcus as its first bishop. Maria only stayed in Colorado three years. Learning that her father was ill, she returned home early to Washington to help care for him. During this time, her mother passed away unexpectedly, so Maria stayed in Washington caring for her father and her two girls until her death in 1929. 
After three and a half years in Eastdale, Marcus moved the family back to Sanford. Annie had four more children while living in Colorado. Marcus continued to farm and owned a threshing company. He also bought extra property in Bountiful and Romeo to farm. In 1909, after 20 years in Colorado, the Funk family decided it was time to return home to Cache Valley. Marcus bought land in Trenton, a farming community just seven miles west of their original home in Richmond. At 66 years old, Marcus again took to the soil growing wheat and sugar beet, aided by his and Steenie's children. Lena's children were all married and had families of their own, so she stayed in town with their daughter Florina, who cared for her through the end of her life. Marcus died November of 1926, just short of his 84th birthday. Lena followed him in death the next year. After Marcus's death, Annie divided her days between her children's homes, Wallace and Doretta. She died in 1938 in Doretta's home in California. Marcus Orlando married Flortilda Iverson in the St. George Temple. Flortilda was Annie's younger sister. They followed the family to Colorado and later moved to Oakley, Idaho. Eventually, they returned to Salt Lake City with their four sons and two daughters. William Jacob Funk married Naomi Roxana Holman. For a time, they lived in the riotous mining town of Creed, where Will worked in the mine and Naomi ran a boarding house. An accident precipitated their move back to Utah, where they finally settled in Benson. They had three sons and a daughter. Eliza Johanna married Louis Burton Westover. Together, they had 12 children who adored her. All the kids helped run one of the largest farms in Cache Valley. They finally settled in Lewiston, where they ran a dairy. Her health was never strong and finally gave out when she was 45, leaving behind children and a husband who revered and honored her. Matilda married Horace Mortensen in 1892. They had a large family and moved to Cache Valley from Colorado. When their daughter Dionysia passed away at 39, leaving six children, two of which were handicapped by rheumatic fever, Matilda took over rearing her young grandchildren. Her sister Florina took Dionysia's handicapped daughters into her care. Willard Peter left Colorado and boarded in Kaysville, Utah with the Stevenson family. He married their daughter, Ida Stevenson. They had three girls and two boys, but eventually divorced. Willard moved to California and married Edith Porter. They were later sealed in the Logan Temple. Clara Ann Funk earned her teaching certificate when she was 16 years old and taught school in Trenton and Smithfield. She married Amnor Gein in 1898. They had three daughters, Iva, Inez, and Marjorie. After moving back to Cache Valley, Amnor worked for the sugar factory and the family lived in Smithfield and Benson. Later, they moved to Warland, Wyoming, where Amner worked in the Holly Sugar Factory, and Clara served as Relief Society president for 12 years. Florina married John William Bentley in 1895 in Sanford, Colorado, and had three children. Their young son, William Raymond, passed away at just seven years old. Daughters Gertrude and Eva lived to become school teachers like their Aunt Clara. Together, they wrote the history of Marcus Esper Funk. Gertrude and Eva never married and lived with their mother, Florina. When Matilda's granddaughters came to live with them after Dionysia's death, all three became mothers to the girls, Doris and Janice. And when Doris married Fred MacDonald, he remarked that he had three mother-in-laws. Walter Richard married Ellen Draper in 1908, but she passed away just a year later. He married Minnie Alvira Burton and had four sons and a daughter. They lived in Cache Valley, and for several years, he carried the mail on a long route to Park Valley. He also worked the mines and herded sheep and farmed his land. Anna Doretta married Jesse Mortensen, brother to Horace, who was married to her older sister Matilda. They had seven children and lived in Colorado where Jesse herded sheep. During a large storm, the sheep ran off a cliff and he lost his herd. They then moved to Amalga and later followed their sons to California where they lived the rest of their lives in the Los Angeles area. Wallace served a mission in the southern states. He married Lula Hauser and they had three sons. They owned a farm in Trenton near Marcus and Annie's farm. Merrill was deaf and married a girl he had met many years earlier at the Colorado School for the Deaf, Mina Thate. He had worked the farm with Marcus for 18 years. 
So when the time came for him to start his own family, Marcus and Annie moved to town and handed the farm over to Merrill and Mina. Merrill farmed his entire life. He had two daughters and a son. Florence also was deaf. Though she married for a time, she did not have children. She lived in California and worked as a talented seamstress in a clothing factory. Like her mother Maria, Mina Aaliyah lived most her life in southern Utah. Like her mother, she had two daughters, and like her mother, she suffered the loss of her husband, James Larson, after only 13 years of marriage. She remarried Neil Sandberg. Children not shown are Lena's triplets, who were born during their time in Washington. Though they were a healthy weight at birth, 18 pounds altogether, they each died within the first week. Lena suspected they died of exposure because the door to the house was left open so people could come and see the babies. Also not shown are Annie's three daughters, Luella, Rosetta, and Josephine. They died in their teenage years, probably from Bright's disease, a kidney ailment. As descendants of these remarkable people, we honor them as we contemplate these anonymous lines. My life is but a weaving between my God and me. I do not choose the colors, he worketh steadily. Oft times he weaveth sorrow, and I in foolish pride forget. He sees the upper, and I the underside. Not till the loom is silent, and the shuttle cease to fly, will God unroll the canvas, and reveal the reason why the dark threads are as needful in the skillful weaver's hand as the threads of gold and silver in the pattern he has planned.